Next speaker is Associate Professor Camille Walsh, who coordinates the Law, Economics, and Public Policy major at UW Bothell. She earned her doctorate in history from the University of Oregon and her JD from Harvard Law School. Dr. Walsh is the author of Racial Taxation, Schools, Segregation, and Taxpayer Citizenship from 1869 to 1973, published by the UNC Press in 2018. Dr. Walsh, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. Um, you know, since I was asked to reflect on voting rights for today's talk, I've had one quote reverberating in my head. Um, and it's from an article that I often give students in introductory law classes, a famous article by the late legal theorist, Robert Cover. He opens the article with the sentence, uh, legal interpretation takes place in a field of pain and death. And the title of this article is Violence and the Word. And he talks in that article about how, you know, sort of you're removed from the courtroom process, uh, from all of the violence by the robes, by the text, by the, um, the parchment barriers, the people who are most affected in many cases aren't even in the room if it's an appellate case at the Supreme Court level. Uh, so it seems very, very removed from those things. And yet those are often the ramifications that can happen. Somebody can be um, removed from their home or their livelihood or their family uh, or their liberty or have their life taken away uh, all through the stroke of a pen, a judicial pen. So he doesn't talk about voting rights in that, Kate, in that article, but when I think about voting rights right now, I think about that sentence because as we've seen um, in cases from the Supreme Court recently, including Shelby versus Holder in 2013, that case invalidated central provisions of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and as we're likely to see more and more voting rights cases and uh, likely in the future vote counting cases reach the court, uh, I think we're going to see the ramifications of those decisions more and more. The right to vote in the words of Justice Earl Warren in Reynolds versus Sims in 1964 is preservative of all the other rights in the constitution. Without it, uh, they are empty in many cases. But the suppression of the right to vote or the legal interpretation that enables the suppression of the right to vote is also facilitative of all other acts of violence and injustice by the state. As many have said, voter suppression is a feature of American democracy, not a bug. It has been with us for 231 years. It has taken various forms. It has been uh, old wine put into new bottles at different moments in US history, but it has never not been here. People have fought and died for the right to vote and they have been beaten and murdered for the right to vote. Um, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner, three civil rights activists in the 1964 Mississippi Freedom Summer were murdered by the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan um, because they were in Mississippi to register people to vote, register African-Americans to vote. Yet as many civil rights activists and historians pointed out, the murders of Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner largely drew national media attention and in fact, federal action and investigation in part because two of the three were white college students from the North. Uh, many, many, many African-American activists, but also just everyday people had been murdered for many, many decades uh, simply for trying to access the ballot. Um, and every major internal event or political shift in US history has been in some sense about the right to vote from the revolution. You know, taxation without representation is largely about being able to vote for the representatives who will tax you. Um, to the Civil War, to the Civil Rights Movement. It's no accident that the Civil War was started in South Carolina, one of two states that at the time had more African-American residents than white residents. The greatest fear by the white minority in that state and in Mississippi was that a free and fair democracy would lead to non-white elected officials. And uh, they did not have the imagination to see a world in which others would treat them with less cruelty than they had treated those over whom they had ruled. The Great Party realignment in the 1964 Democratic Convention in the midst of the Civil Rights Movement, when segregationists defected en masse to the Republican Party from the Democratic Party. And you know, as students in my history classes I'll often have this moment of, wait, what happened? And how did that become that? Um, that largely came about 
in part due to years of struggles over segregation in every different form. I write about educational segregation. Um, segregation was rife throughout many states in the South as well as the North, but it was predicated by the seating or the attempted seating of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party at that convention, the electrifying testimony by civil rights activist Fannie Lou Hamer, who testified on live television, much to LBJ's chagrin, um, on the convention floor about the beatings and imprisonments that she had experienced in Mississippi fighting for the right to vote. That realignment occurred because of voter suppression and voting rights. So America's decentralized voting and election system in the constitution is really premised on state and local authorities deciding how to vote and how elections will proceed. The founders were largely dismissive of the idea that um, overwhelming democracy would lead to uh, a good form of government. In fact, they were far more concerned with ensuring that a small minority, for example, uh, those who could have initially vote in the elections, white landowning males, uh, and by the way, they had to own the land without debt. So white men out there who have a mortgage, it still would have excluded you. Um, that those, that minority population would not have its rights infringed upon by a majority that they did not believe should necessarily have access to uh, elected office or the vote. Early on, some states had so many varying provisions in this decentralized system that in a handful of cases, you know, sort of like a woman might sneak in because the state law just said persons um, or free blacks in some states in the North were able to uh, access the franchise. States did make more uniformly consistent exclusionary laws as time went on in the early 19th century. And many constitutional theorists today, when they look at the language of the right to vote in the constitution, uh, question whether if a state chose, it could simply not allow its citizens to vote for president, for example, um, as long as it did so universally, as long as it excluded on a universal basis and didn't sort of pick and choose a group that could participate, there is at least a question of whether it would violate any specific provision of the constitution. For even after explicit constitutional amendments, such as the 15th amendment, uh, states found ways to prevent African-Americans and other people of color from voting. The worst incident of racial violence in the Reconstruction era occurred in Colfax, Louisiana in 1873, the Colfax Massacre, in which white supremacists attacked and murdered more than 100 African Americans who had attempted to seat the candidate who won the election. The Supreme Court in U.S. versus Cruikshank a few years later held that the 14th Amendment did not apply the Bill of Rights to state governments and reversed the criminal convictions for these civil rights violations. Um, legal interpretation takes place in the fields of pain and death from Jim Crow laws, to poll taxes, to literacy tests, to today's limitations on polling hours, locations, voter ID laws, and every other tactic. We've seen different tactics locally without any federal guarantee of the right to vote. So when I'm teaching US history classes, I often give students, um, when we come to these decades in the civil rights movement, I often give them the literacy tests that were applied in places like Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi in these decades. Um, and the questions are, they vary widely, but they're, variations on extraordinarily convoluted uh, topics. They might ask you to interpret a lengthy provision of the state con constitution about um, the collection of, of uh, annualized taxation, uh, or if you're white, they might give you just a sentence on the free speech clause in the state constitution, a very simple one. Or they might ask you to draw lines around certain words and not make any other marks on the paper. So when I give these tests, I, I ask students a trick question. It's not really fair because of course they struggle. They can't figure it out. The answers are impossible. And I ask them how many of them think they would have been able to vote. And of course, none of them raised their hand. <laughs> but the truth is that if you were white and you know maybe didn't look too poor or too dangerous, uh, the registrar would simply check it off and give you permission to register to vote. And if you were black and got every answer right, uh, the registrar in many cases might just not even look at the paper, crumple it up and throw it away, or might look at it and say, oh, you made a mark on this side of the paper and you're not allowed to make any marks, so it's invalid. Or, oh, you drew a line where actually when we said line, you're supposed to draw a square or vice versa if you draw a square. Um, that local control over who has access to the ballot has permeated tactics of voter suppression throughout history. Historian Eric Foner has said of America that we have long been torn between whether voting is a right that all people should have or whether voting is something only the right people should do. 
Yet in other countries, especially countries we occupied after war, countries like Japan, Germany, Afghanistan, and Iraq, um, we have insisted, you know, in our, in our view of ourselves as promoting democracy globally, insisted on a robust and clear right to vote in the constitution. The constitution we imposed on Japan after World War II stated that universal adult suffrage is guaranteed, period. No caveats or limitations. Um, the right to vote in our constitution is mentioned more than five times, or sorry, it's mentioned more times than any other right, five times. Um, the rights that we talk about so often, most often perhaps, uh, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourth or Fifth in criminal cases, really are just there the once. But because the right to vote each time uh, builds on its past iteration, in each case, it doesn't make a blanket statement of the right. Each time the right to vote is mentioned, uh, it's mentioned in the 14th, by the way, um, the, the provision in the 14th Amendment also, however, allows states to um, disenfranchise those who've been convicted of a felony within their state. It's mentioned in the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, um, which was enacted, as we said, 20, uh, 100 years ago this year. The 24th Amendment, the ban the poll tax, and the 26th Amendment, which ensured that young people aged 18 to 21 who had been uh, fighting and dying in our nation's wars would not be denied the vote. But because the way each of those amendments is phrased, the right to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of race, sex, age, etc. cetera. Uh, the caveats are all about motivation. So there are limitations in place around what kind of motivation you could have for denying or in abridging someone's right to vote. The problem uh, for anyone who's studied law or practice law is that motivation is the most difficult thing to prove. You have to prove what's in someone's head and heart. Um, unless someone explicitly says, we are doing a specific thing to suppress the vote on the basis of race, which actually did happen a few years ago in North Carolina because they were so blatant about it. Um, but unless they do that, unless you can find that smoking gun, a court that wishes to ignore the historical context of violent voter suppression in the US can simply assume good motivations, good intentions, um, and they have often done that, especially in the past several years. So one of the things that one of my students in my constitutional law class suggested, uh, I like to do an end of quarter, like come propose your own amendment session. Um, and one of my students last spring proposed an amendment that simply said, the right to vote for all adults cannot be abridged or denied. And then it stopped, not on account of anything, simply cannot be abridged or denied. Um, the kind of amendment that we've put in place in other countries, what would it mean if we had that kind of amendment or that kind of guarantee or protection of the right to vote? Um, there, is, there is an amendment that's been proposed just a couple months ago on the 55th anniversary of the enactment of the Voting Rights Act from uh, the National Fair Vote Movement. And it, it does a version of what my students did in a sort of more elaborately legal form. Um, so we'll see, we'll see where that goes. I'll just close by saying it's often easy to tell ourselves that our history as a nation has been one of ever increasing and ever expanding democracy and liberty, sort of a constant progress narrative going up. But historians will tell you that every moment of our history has been expansion and contraction of democracy, of liberty, of rights um, at different times, right? The Reconstruction era is a huge example of this, but there are other moments as well. And for many years now, we've been living in a moment of contraction of voting rights. There may be, and there hopefully will be, moments of expansion of voting rights in the future and more affirmative confirmations of those rights. Um, I often tell students when I'm trying to give them a pep talk this year, that the one thing we know from studying history, the one thing you can say about the future, lots of disciplines are in the field of predictions, historians are not. But what historians can say we know is that the future will be different. Now in good times, I'm always telling them that and I'm Debbie Downer because the future could be worse. But this year I've been telling them not to tell them the future could be much better than today. And I hope it will be. And then perhaps as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, one key part of the promissory note contained in our founding documents like the constitution will finally be paid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Walsh. For 231 years, the US Constitution has kept our nation alive and strong in good times and bad, in prosperity and through depression, in war and peace. 
We will now read our founding document from start to finish, from we the people to the words of the 27th Amendment. <laughs> 